Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be learning about the 1987 film simply called Francis. If you're not familiar with that one, it's the story of Francis Farmer's rise to fame in Hollywood and Broadway before her career took a turn with mental health issues. Joining us to help separate fact from fiction is writer and author Jack L. High. Jack is the author of The Lobotomist, which is the biography of Dr. Walter Freeman, who we see in the movie Giving Francis Farmer a Lobotomy. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we dig into today's story, we need to set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one. Francis Farmer was not born into a wealthy family. Number two, Henry York really did help Francis escape from the mental institution. Number three, Dr. Freeman never gave Francis a lobotomy like the movie suggests. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll know which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to connect with Jack L. High about the historical accuracy of Francis. We will get into some of the details in a little bit, but from an overall perspective, you take a step back, how accurate would you say the movie did capturing the essence of Francis Farmer's story? Well, if I had to give it a letter grade, uh, I would give it probably a C. And that's because on the positive side, I think it follows the contours of Francis Farmer's life um, and uh, puts, it, it puts her life in a context uh, so that the events of her life make sense. Uh, but there are a few whoppers in it. Uh, that that contribute to me downgrading it down to a C. <laughs> well, end of the day, it is a movie. I guess C, C is, it's not an F. It could be worse. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be worse. So I, I guess I would say it is somewhat accurate, but uh, no one should look to the movie Francis as an authoritative guide to Francis Farmer's life. Well, at the very beginning of the movie, uh, Francis Farmer wins a competition with an essay denying God. The movie doesn't really give a lot of indication of where or when, but we do get some clues of time and place. One of those is a banner while she's reading the essay. The banner in the background says National High School Essay Contest 1931. So we get a year. Uh, In the next couple scenes, We see a few more clues through newsreels mentioning the Great Depression, again, kind of that that time frame, and mentioning that uh, Francis was a 16-year-old high school junior, and they are in the Seattle area, so we get time and place. While Francis and her father are watching the newsreel, Francis hides her face in embarrassment as the reporters on the reel interview her mom about the controversial essay. Now, I will admit that I wasn't really familiar with Francis Farmer before preparing for our discussion. So I felt a little in the dark around how the movie kind of portrayed this, you know, setting up who she was, what was going on at this point in history. So can you give a little more historical context around Francis and this controversial essay that we see in the movie? Well, as as you gathered, it is the early 1930s, really bad years in the Great Depression. And, and there are some early, um, you know, brief fleeting shots at the beginning of the movie of, of uh, down and out people on the street and standing in lines and things like that. And this was also a time when uh, communism had uh, probably its greatest appeal ever in the United States during the 1930s. Um, so Francis, uh, as a high school student, did enter a contest that was sponsored by Scholastic Magazine, uh, an essay contest, and she won. So she got a hundred dollars and a lot of news coverage. The title of the essay she wrote, I don't remember if the title is mentioned in the movie. It's called "God Dies," and it's uh, about um, 
the conflict in her own mind and in her own experience about believing, wanting to believe in a God who is in control of things, yet seeing in all the chaos in the world around her and all the hardship uh, and the people suffering. And um, she wrote uh, later on that it was inspired by uh, the writings of Friedrich Nietzsche. So she was a smart student. She was reading Friedrich Nietzsche, and she was uh, a quite accomplished writer, even as a high school student. And um, so I think uh, I think it's a good way to start the film because it tells us a, a lot. It's perhaps confusing if you have no idea who Frances Farmer is, but it uh, tells us a lot about her as a young woman, that she's very bright, a good writer. She's idealistic and um, not afraid of putting herself out there and being herself, which is one of the themes of the movie. It's That's interesting that... Um it was scholastic because in the movie they mentioned that she, because of this, uh, it, she wins a trip to Moscow. And I think there's some dialogue in there kind of causes some commotion because they mentioned that she won a trip to a communist country from a communist newspaper is how they phrased it. But Francis wants to go because the return trip, according to the movie, at least is going to drop her off in New York City. So she kind of wants to go. To, she's going to do the trip to Moscow to go from Seattle to uh, New York City. And then that kind of leads into her life in Hollywood. She gets a job as an actor in, in Hollywood because things in Broadway on Broadway don't really go the way that she wants. But she sees Hollywood, at least as far as the movie is concerned, as kind of a stepping stone back. She really her goal and goal is Broadway. Was that did the movie do a good job setting up? how she built her acting career kind of went from this trip, which it granted it does kind of jump forward a few years. So I'm not really sure if it's connected to that or if that's something else that she's written. Uh, again, it kind of, I'm not, as I'm not as familiar with, with Francis's story, it, the way it kind of portrayed some things, I was like, wait, is this connect is the trip to Moscow connected to the, uh, to what she wrote or was that something different because it fast forward a few years and then all of a sudden she's in Hollywood. How did it do setting up her eventually getting into building an acting career in Hollywood? The, uh, the trip to Moscow um, that she won was not connected to the essay. So that, that she wrote as a high school student. So this was a few years later when she's a student at the university of Washington and uh, she won this trip to Moscow on the basis of selling a lot of subscriptions to a newspaper. Uh, I, I don't think it was a communist newspaper, but it was a leftist newspaper. And uh, she must have been a champion seller because she, she won the grand prize. And uh, you're right, she was more interested, it seems, in the return trip from Moscow, which would leave her in New York City, than the actual trip to Moscow. And I haven't uh, ever seen very much about what happened to her in Moscow. I know she did visit a theater company um, in the USSR, but um, it doesn't seem to have influenced her very much. And m much more important was that after going to Russia, she ended up in New York City. And there she got an agent, a, th a theatrical agent, who referred her to um, a scout for Paramount Pictures. And uh, on the basis of that and the screen test and so on, she was signed while she was in New York to a seven-year contract with Paramount. And um, so it really was that trip, in a sense, that got her launched. She knew what she wanted, and it worked out the way she had hoped that it would. And once she was at Paramount, she started out doing a, a series of B-movies. Those went well. And she graduated to some A movies. She the, the movie shows the uh, chair on the set with her name on it next to Bing Crosby's chair, and that did happen. She was in a movie with Bing Crosby called Rhythm on the Range, and then after Rhythm on the Range came Come and Get It, which really was a a significant movie of the time. I believe it was 1940 or 41. Um, no, earlier, excuse me. It was, it was in the mid 1930s, maybe 1936. And, uh, that put her on the map. And, um, and then she later did another A film with 
Cary Grant called the toast of New York. So uh, that part of the of the movie is quite accurate in setting up how she got uh, to, from being an unknown who had been doing theater productions at the University of Washington to getting a contract with Paramount and becoming a star. Okay, well that that tells me that perhaps she didn't didn't come from a lot of wealth because why go to Moscow just to get to New York City? <laughs> Her winning the trip, you know, she can't afford essentially just to go from Washington to New York City. Otherwise, that's a uh, that's a little bit out of the way. <laughs> Right. And, and travel was very expensive then, even in relative terms to now, um, more expensive to get to New York City from Seattle than it would cost in today's dollars. Um, her family was not at the poverty level, middle class, um, uh, perhaps lower middle class, but somewhere there in the middle. And when we do see Frances return to Seattle in the movie, she's returning as a famous movie star. So they roll the red carpet out for her. Uh, there's a, a lady there who greets Francis and starts to give her an award on behalf of the Seattle Ladies Club. And then Francis cuts her off and is like, aren't you the one that damned me to hell? <laughs> Remembering a lady was, was speaking out against her essay in, in high school. And that kind of takes, takes her aback. Uh, then she goes on to explain to the lady who she was. You know, she's the one that, that wrote the es- essay. And so how did Frances's fame in Hollywood change people's perspective of her back home in Seattle? It's a little hard to know that because that's one of the um, aspects of her life that I don't think is well recorded. I don't think the event with the woman in the lobby of the movie theater who she reminds, you're the one who condemned me to hell when I gave my read my essay. I don't think that ever happened. I've never seen any evidence that it ever happened, and it's a little too story perfect. But it, to me, it seems likely um, that when she came back, a movie star uh, to Seattle, that people did tr- uh, treat her differently, and that uh, her being the um, idealistic and headstrong and um, a person seeking genuine relations with people that she was, that, that it was not, if that happened, it was not something that she would respond to very well. People treating her like royalty because she was a movie star. Okay. Okay. And was there, I guess to go, go back a little bit, do we know it if there was any sort of that reaction to her essay of, because in the movie, the lady stands up and right in the middle of the essay just says, you're going to go to hell. I don't remember the exact words that she says, but you know, she just tells tells Francis off right there in high school. Did that happen? I've never seen any evidence that that actually happened when she read the essay. And remember, this is the 1930s, not the 1950s, which were a little more uh, conservative in the 50s uh, in, ter- in looking at religion and also communism. Uh, a, l- a lot of people had communist leanings and in, in by corollary, atheist leanings in the 1930s. I don't think it would have been considered uh, that uh, all that unusual, it was certainly shocking to people who were religious, but there was a lot of newspaper coverage of her essay and not all of it was good. And the movie does make a, a point to mention a play that's written by one Mr. Oditz. And according to the movie, Francis's character would be named Lorna Moon, and the play is called Golden Boy. But that deal seems to fall through in the movie as some an unnamed rich actress invests in the movie on the condition that she plays Lorna Moon. So Francis is out. I, I did a little bit of research and found that play, Golden Boy, and it ran from November 1937 to June of 1938, although the movie doesn't mention that at all. Um, it, I f- kind of felt at this point that there's another part here missing from Francis's story in history that the movie isn't showing. Is there some is, there's there's some context in history that you can share with us that kind of helps fill in what's going on here? Yes, uh, that part of Fr- Francis Farmer's history is greatly telescoped in the movie. So uh, she was in Golden Boy. Uh, she played in 248 performances of it in New York. Uh, and then the play went out on a, a tour um, where she got really good notices. Uh, that was not mentioned in the movie. 
And then, as, as you, you see in the movie, they're moving uh, to uh, some performances in London. And what's described in the movie did actually happen. Francis was replaced uh, by another actress for the London performances uh, who was willing to put up some money to help the play along. It, it also left out was that after Golden Boy and after she had lost the part in the play, she did appear in other perform- uh, theater performances in New York City. So she, um, you know, she had a substantial theater career and, and theater background. Okay, and that was that was after her in Hollywood, though, right? That's right. After she had done her 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 best known movies in Hollywood. Uh, then she went to New York and did and worked with Odets and his theater company and got replaced in the London performance. Okay, yeah, cause the movie doesn't show any of that. I, so the impression I got from the movie was she went to Hollywood because she couldn't make it in, on Broadway, and then it doesn't really show her going back. So I just assumed that she would never really got to achieve her goal of performing Broadway, but it sounds like she did. She did. It may not have been uh, uh, as much performing on Broadway as she had wanted, but she she did. You know, she did perform on Broadway, and she made a splash. If we go back to the movie, there's uh, a time in in Mexico, and and then Francis returns to find that the studio has taken all the stuff out of her house to make room for a new actress. I guess the studio was owned the house. Um, and then after oversleeping and missing half the day for a movie, she just blows up on set and punches the lady doing her hair and quits right there. She kind of, uh, in the next scene, Francis is sleeping in a hotel. Some police burst in in the middle of the night to arrest her. She's sentenced to 180 days in county jail, and she blows up again, and they have to drag her out of the courtroom. It seems like all of a sudden things are just not going well for her at all. Did that happen? Roughly, it happened. Um, a couple of things are not shown, though. She she had a, a bad drinking problem, and um, before the that terrible scene where she's uh, uh, yanked out of her hotel room, she there had been other incidents where she had been drunk in public and had caused uh, you know she caused public um, inc- incidents in public. Um, going back for a, a second to uh, when the movie shows her coming home and the studio has replaced. Her, moved another actress into her home. That didn't happen. Her uh, belongings were taken out of her home, but it seems likely that her mother did that, not the studio. And maybe it just seemed more dramatic uh, and and more of a sign of her standing in Hollywood to have have the studios do it. But the scene, um, very vivid scenes in the courtroom and of her arrest and in the courtroom, those are quite accurate, I think, even using the actual dialogue that was recorded, that was um, published in newspapers at the time and set down by reporters who were there. So that, uh, to answer your question, that did happen in its basics. Yeah, I imagine uh, that sort of story would have been in the news quite a bit around that time or did it get overshadowed because around this this time i'm assuming this is in the 40s at this point and there were some other things going on in the world that hit the news around that that time as well right well no it, it was it was much in the news uh she was uh, you know she was a favorite of the scandal mongers in the press and uh, this only gave them much more to work with so it, it was very well known what was happening to her Oh, I thought that was interesting. You mentioned that it was more likely her mother. That makes a lot more sense. I thought it was kind of, it, it hit me as strange that she's this big Hollywood actor and the studio owns her home. She can't, she doesn't even have her own house. Yeah. And, um, she, and after the big films that she was in, she was having a lot of conflicts on the sets uh, of later movies that she was in. She was arguing with directors a lot about her character. She thought that her parts were uh, often over glamorized to the point that her characters were not realistic or believable. And so people began to see her as a troublemaker on the set, although everyone acknowledged her great talents too. 
do you think that's something that was more, you said she had a drinking problem. Do you think it was more in line with that or was it her just standing up? Because a lot of the roles back then were not real realistic. I think it's both. I think she, her drinking problems, uh, her alcoholism made her unstable. and uh, But I also think that she um, legitimately and truly felt that her roles were less than they could have been because of the um, shallow way that Hollywood then and even later saw female roles. So um, she had a legitimate gripe, I think. Well, going back to the movie... Uh, because of her present state, Francis is sent to the Meadowwood Convalescent Home. And right away, a man named Dr. Symington says he's going to, he, or he's looking forward to solving her predicament. How well did the movie portray Francis going from being a Hollywood star or Broadway stars, as you mentioned, and even though that's not shown in the movie, uh, to being sent to Meadowwood? I think it was a, a fair job. Of that, um, Meadowwood was actually a sanitarium called the Kimball Sanitarium, not Meadowwood. And, um, she was diagnosed there by two psychiatrists, uh, with what they could then called paranoid schizophrenia. So she did receive an actual diagnosis of a psychiatric illness there. And, um, the movie shows her receiving uh, insulin coma therapy at that sanitarium, and um, which surprised me. It, it did happen there, and it's, it's so surprising to me that they would give a treatment like that at a private, small, more informal hospital, uh, because that's a really dangerous therapy. It was then, and the the thinking behind, behind it was that pe- uh, people who suffer from mental illness. In many cases, it was thought that they needed a um, kind of like a rebooting of their brain, like you'd reboot a computer. And so there were various ways used to cause that rebooting. Overdosing the patient on insulin to the point of coma was one of them. There are other chemicals that were used. And that's also the theory behind electroconvulsive therapy, which we see later in the movie, is is just to get the brain to start all over again and clear out uh, whatever they thought was wrong initially. Wow. And you, you said that that treatment was not that common. Was there something about her case that was different that that she was given that treatment at Meadowood? It was somewhat common. If you've ever seen the movie uh, A Beautiful Mind about the mathematician John Nash, there's insulin coma therapy in that movie also. Uh, but, uh, but it surprised me that it was done in a place like that instead of in a more formal psychiatric hospital setting. Okay. So it wasn't not necessarily that it happened, but that it happened there. Right. Well, if we go back to the movie after a fight with her mother, who's also her legal, legal guardian at this point. Francis is forced to go to a mental institution where she seems to undergo shock treatment. The movie doesn't give any sort of dates or places, though. Can you fill in some more historical context around what actually happened? Yeah. So um, the movie shows uh, that when Francis is in the sanitarium, that she escaped with the help of her friend Henry York. Henry York didn't exist. There was no such person. And uh, he's, but he's a very useful character in the film because he's a thread that runs from the beginning to the end and helps in terms of the plot of the movie, helps Francis get from one place to another. She did walk out of Kimball, the sanitarium, but she went on her own to um, a relative's house, her half sister's house. And then Lillian, her mother, came down from Seattle to California. And Lillian was opposed to, did not did not know about the insulin coma therapy, didn't like it, and was opposed at that point to Francis getting more psychiatric treatment. So Lillian got formal guardianship of Francis and uh, moved her back to Seattle. Uh, they, they were both resistant to Francis getting more treatment. And it's when 
Francis was living with Lillian in Seattle, as the movie shows, that uh, bad things started to happen. They argued a lot and they had fights uh, leading up to Lillian feeling that the only way, the only thing she could do was to get Francis committed to a, a state psychiatric hospital, which is a more serious kind of place than Kimball had been earlier. And that's, and Francis wrote later that she began to see her mother as an enemy then. And so where Francis went was, as the name isn't mentioned in the film, I don't think, Western State Hospital in Stellicum, Washington, which is just south of Tacoma. And it was a very, it, it was kind of like the archetypal, horrible state psychiatric hospital, crowded dirty, um, too big, really, too many patients there for anyone to get any kind of individualized treatment. And so that's how she ended up at the uh, state hospital. And she actually was there in two two uh, phases. One was uh, a shorter stay. The first stay was a shorter stay. She was released in 1944 to go back to her family, but she was soon arrested for vagrancy. She, her father took her to her aunt's ranch in Nevada to stay in. None of this is in the movie. And she ran away from there and returned to Lillian. And things were bad again between them. So Lillian um, arranged for a sanity hearing to be made for Francis. And at that hearing, the court recommended that she be recommitted to Western State Hospital. And that's where she spent the next five years or so. Um, as a patient in that hospital where things really got bad for her, according to the movie. It sounds like her mother had a, a huge part to play in um, sending Francis away. And I'm curious if, I mean, there's th people fight <laughs> that, that happens. Um, do you think, do you think there was legitimate reason that her mother had for, to sending her away or were they just fighting and not getting along and, and her mother trying to get out, get her out of her hair essentially. Um, and that's the way that she can do that. I think uh, th there's a, uh, something that her mother says in the movie where um, she tells Francis, you know, I'm just trying to get you back on your feet. And I think that's probably the truest summation of what her mother was doing. There, there are uh, some suggestions in the movie that Lillian had been frustrated with her own life and really loved this, loved the glamorous life that Francis was leading as a movie star and, and wanted that again. But I think it was more about her um, wanting to get Francis going again and that she didn't like the direction that Francis' life was headed in. So I think it was a little more commonplace of a mother-daughter conflict uh, than the movie suggested. Yeah, the impression I got from the movie was very much what you said, where the mother kind of liked the glamorous life and uh, wanted to get back to that. Yeah, that, that's the impression you get from the movie. You said that she was released in 1944, and I'm curious. There was a, there was a part in the movie where uh, she kind of puts on a performance at a hearing to determine if she should stay in the institution. Of course, they don't know it's a performance. <laughs> we, knew, we know as uh, movie watchers, it's a, she's putting out a performance. They think that they've cured her and they send her home. Her mother and some reporters are waiting there. And this is this was kind of what I was referring to in, in this particular bit of dialogue is where you know her mother starts talking about her going back to, to Hollywood and going back to acting and kind of get the impression that uh, she, she wants to go back to that life for herself. Uh, but then in the movie... Oh, maybe even that night we don't we don't really see a lot of time again but you know nightfall francis leaves the house with a suitcase goes to meet harry for a while before she tries hitchhiking and she ends up getting picked up by the cops instead and they force her to go back to the institution was that the part that you were referring to where she was let go or was that a different time where then she was caught and forced to go back I think that time when she gives the performance corresponds to the time when um, she was released in 1944 on a parole to her family. And then the part where the police pick her up uh, hitchhiking is 
corresponds to the time when her mother in, in actually had a sanity hearing for her and she was recommitted. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm curious, since she was an actress, did that, and, and then we see her putting on that performance for the, the board in the movie, was that a, an actual concern that they had of her, like to where they thought that she might be playing a role, but not really being helped? I don't know if anyone knows that for certain, but if I were the doctors uh, in charge of her, I would have been concerned about it. But they must have been persuaded because they l- let her go on the parole. Definitely be something uh, you know that you would have. As a doctor, you'd have that in your mind of, you know, it's this person just putting on a performance, <laughs> telling me what I want to hear. And, and I think probably a lot of patients who weren't actors put on performances. Well, a- according to the movie, when Frances does go back to the institution a second time, uh, this time she's given a transorbital lobotomy. And the movie explains the lobotomy as being a very simple process. Uh, you just insert the tool beneath the eyelid. I mean, it, look, it's one of those things that you can feel the pain as you're watching them explain how they're shoving this thing in your eye and and up into your brain. And then according to the movie, the way they're explaining it, they just kind of move it around a little bit, get rid of some of those connections. Uh, and the doctor is boasting that he can do 10 of them in an hour. It's, it's super simple to do. And they're going to prove that they can do it so fast. And Francis is one of the 10 that we see. Uh, we don't actually see the operation, but you know, we assume, of course, that that, that happened. Uh, did that actually happen? Well, this is the scene that got me interested in this movie uh, because I was – it's what introduced me to the, the treatment called lobotomy. So uh, did this really happen? Not to Francis Farmer. Uh, there were about 300 lobotomies performed at Western State Hospital between the late 1940s and early 1950s, but not to Francis. And uh, we know that for two reasons. There is no record of a lobotomy, uh, no um, notation or any, any kind of evidence of a lobotomy in her medical record from that time. And also, um, in my research on lobotomies, I checked into the uh, medical journal articles that the psychiatrists at Western State Hospital published during this time, and they published a complete list of patients who had received lobotomies there during those years, along with their demographic information, male, female, age, et cetera. And there was not one uh, that fit Francis Farmer. So uh, from that information, it's, it's also clear that she did not receive a lobotomy. Also, although the, in the movie, the doctor who performs the lobotomy isn't named, his name was Walter Freeman. And um, he was a uh, psychiatrist and neurologist who traveled all around the country during those years, giving lobotomies to patients in state psychiatric hospitals. And I researched in uh, among Dr. Freeman's papers at George Washington University in D.C. Uh, I went through everything Dr. Freeman wrote. He never mentions Francis Farmer's name. And if she had been his patient there, if he had given her a lobotomy, he would have mentioned her because he was very um, motivated to mention the successes of his patients. And if she had undergone a lobotomy, she would have been by far his most successful patient or among them because she made a movie after her, after this supposedly happened. She was on TV and more theater productions, hosted a TV show, etc. So it didn't happen. And so how did it get into the movie is the question. And it's because the movie was based on a biography of Francis Farmer called Shadowland, written by a Seattle writer named William Arnold. And uh, Arnold made up a lot of stuff in this book, including the lobotomy. (laughs) And so when the filmmakers adapted uh, Arnold's work, they included the lobotomy because it was in the book. And uh, there's some litigation about this afterwards. And in that litigation, Arnold admitted that he had made it up. 
Wow, that that's pretty. Uh, not sure the right word to, to use, but that's that's pretty pretty uh, strong out there. Just to to go ahead and make that up. It is, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, so that's one of the um, one of the real uh, great fictionalized elements of this movie. Unfortunately, it's a scene in the movie that almost everyone remembers later after seeing it. And another scene that almost everyone remembers later is a scene in Western State Hospital where the servicemen come in uh, by arrangement with the male attendants in the hospital to come in and rape the women patients. That also never happened. There were no men attendants in the women's wing of the hospital, and there's no evidence whatsoever that service members or anybody else ever came in to do that. How well did the movie do explaining the lobotomy itself? Because the impression that I got was that... It's more about quantity rather than quality, I guess would be the the phrase to use. Like they're they're trying to just get a lot of them done. And it, at least as far as the movie, it doesn't really seem like they're finding the best the best ten patients that this might really help. It's more just we want to get a bunch of them done. I think you're right. It, it was it was quite accurate. I was impressed with this part of the uh, of the movie and the accuracy of how the lobotomy is described and uh, how the actor uh, playing Dr. Freeman looks. He's dressed just like him with the sleeveless t-shirt and the hairy arms and all that. And he talks like him. And um, uh, what Dr. Freeman did was he went from one hospital to another and he operated on who the hospital management provided to him. So these were patients, uh, by and large, who were not doing well and um, needed something drastic done for them. And um, these hospitals were very overcrowded. They just wanted to get patients out. And if there was a procedure like lobotomy that could treat them in a way that would re- not require them to be hospitalized anymore, they were all in favor of that. So it was kind of a um, roulette deal who got the lobotomy and who didn't it was who the hospital officials wanted to present and get out of there feed it back make sure i'm understanding it sounds like lobotomy is almost like a a hail mary of nothing else will work and this is this is all, all we can do yes that's that's often how it was thought of as a last resort treatment Freeman believed that about one third of the patients he lobotomized were helped. Uh, and then the other two thirds were either left without change or made worse. And helped, what helped meant is not what we would think of as helped necessarily, but they were able to get out of the hospital and be cared for at home. The impression I got from the the movie and the way it kind of explained things was um, at least in Francis's case, of course, that we know from what you just said, that obviously didn't happen to her. But the impression I got was the lobotomy ha- more helped the people around her than her because she wasn't making as much making as much noise and being as much trouble to them. And so the impression I got was more we're going to help Francis, but really we just want her to be quiet and follow along. That That was a big element of it to make them more manageable, so manageable that they could be cared for at home. And these hospitals, you know, had financial problems, they overcrowded, they had to get people out. At the very end of the movie, there is some text that says Francis made one final movie, then moved to Indianapolis where she hosted a daytime TV show. And she died on August 1st, 1970 at the age of 56. And the movie says Harry was not with her. Of course, as you said, he wasn't a real person. So she died as she lived alone. Is that really what happened to Francis after the timeline of the movie? No, she did not die alone, for one thing. And she did a lot more. Uh, after her release from the hospital, she did a lot more than um, what was in that text. So she initially held a number of jobs. Some of them were menial jobs, sorting laundry in a hotel. She cared for Lillian in her final days. Uh, 
Um, she was a bookkeeper and a secretary in a photo studio, a hotel clerk. She married twi- two times after she left the hospital. And then um, she, uh, and this is shown um, in the film, uh, she was on the TV show, This Is Your Life with Ralph Edwards, and comes a- across as um, a little robotic. Um, I, th- I think that's how she was played. Uh, in the context of her having a, a lobotomy, you can see on YouTube that actual This Is Your Life episode and see that she's not robotic at all. She's quite glib and um, has normal affect and sa- sounds good. So I urge anyone, if they're interested in this, to find that on YouTube. It's it's uh, very interesting. And then because of the, her, the, her one of her marriages, she moved to Uh, She was on the Ed Sullivan show twice also. She um, moved to Indianapolis where she did host a TV show and um, was in stage productions at Purdue University in Indiana and the actress in residence at the university. She was still drinking. Um, she She had at least one DUI arrest, converted to Catholicism in 1968, and then died in 1970 from cancer. But she was not alone, and she didn't have this empty, uh, soulless life that the movie suggests happened to her at the end. Since the lobotomy didn't actually happen, but the way that she's portrayed in the movie after the lobotomy is very subdued, would she actually have been that way if they had done a lobotomy on her, not that everybody is the same in there, but is that a common after effect of that? Not necessarily. No. Some uh, lobotomy patients became very uninhibited and um, were a little hard to control, told, you know, even prim proper patients before their lobotomy became people who told dirty jokes and, um, uh, you know, had very, very coarse senses of humor and things like that. So not necessarily. Uh, in the public mind, we think of lobotomy patients as people who became vegetables. And that did not happen in many instances. Some people returned to work. Some people did become vegetables. But there's a wide range, and that's because the procedure itself was very imprecise in, w- in what, what in the brain was actually cut. And because it was a blind operation, the way Freeman did it, he couldn't see what he was doing. He was just sticking the 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 surgical tool in and moving it around. And in some people, that caused a lot of damage. In some people, uh, it probably caused very little change. Were they actually trying to do something specific, or was it uh, was Freeman like you're saying? You just stick the tool up there and kind of move it around. That's the way the the movie explains it too, and it doesn't really look like he's trying to get you know get to this one specific part it more seems like we're just gonna shuffle things around up there and see what happens <laughs> he wanted to uh interrupt the neural connections between a part of the brain called the thalamus and the frontal lobes and he believed that a lot of the symptoms of mental illness were caused by overly strong emotional signals coming from the thalamus to the frontal lobe. So if those were cut off or weakened, then the patient would behave better. Uh, He acknowledged that it didn't cure anything to get a lobotomy. It just treated the symptoms and made people more, uh, he hoped, more likely to behave normally. Okay. Okay. Well, that makes a lot more sense. That I, I'm not a doctor by any means, but the way I've always understood the way painkillers, simple painkillers, over the counter medicine, things like that work is not that they really solve the pain itself, but they go to the brain and, and block it out essentially. So you're not feeling it. So it sounds like with the lobotomy, those those signals are still there. They're just dampened or cut or maybe not being sent pro- properly or received properly. Yeah, not going anywhere. Uh, it's funny you mentioned pain because lobotomy was also used at this time to treat people who had chronic pain so that they, uh, many of them said afterwards that they still felt the pain, but it didn't bother them as much. So was it used for more than mental health treatment? Beyond the the pain part, no. Uh, 
Uh, well, there, there were a few, uh, Freeman didn't do this, but a few other um, psychiatrists who tried lobotomies to treat criminal behavior, uh, and that was very unsuccessful. It's commonly believed, I found, that lobotomy was used to um, end homosexual behavior in people. I've not found, uh, in all the research I've done on this subject, I have not found anything to support that. And I know Freeman didn't perform any lobotomies for that reason. But um, it, it was, by and large, used for psychiatric illness treatment. Well, let's say that you were in charge of making the movie. What's something that you would have done differently? Well, uh, if the movie is about Frances Farmer's strong spirit and her efforts to be herself and um, and to um, overcome what Hollywood wanted her to be, I think one thing that I would have done would is would be to keep this imaginary character Harry York out of it because he's always appearing to rescue her, move her from one place to another, help her out, and uh, it makes her seem dependent on him at times. And I think she'd come across as more of we'd see more of the essence of her strength without Harry in the movie. And and but. You, uh, th that character is played by Sam Shepard, who did does a great job. Um, so it's this is not a rap against his performance at all, but um, I think Francis's character would be stronger without him. So let's say that they're like somebody listening to this. They they've watched the movie and they don't know. They haven't done any more research. They don't know anything else from history. But you mentioned at the beginning that. Uh, you gave it a C. So not real reliable as far as a, a biography of Francis Farmer. So let's say somebody wants to learn more about Francis. What's something that you feel they should know about the real story that the movie doesn't share? It, it would be uh, what we talked about a little earlier, that after her release from Western State Hospital, Francis had a life. Uh, she was um, in a fulfilling life. She certainly had her problems. But she was not an empty shell. And uh, it bothers me that people might see this movie and think of the 20 years she lived after her release from the hospital as just empty time when she was going through the motion, motions. She wasn't. She had important people in her life and people appreciated her. That to me is sad. And uh, I, that's an impression the movie gives that I don't think is good. Thank you so much for coming on to chat about Francis. Uh, you mentioned him earlier, Dr. Walter Freeman. You wrote a fan fascinating book about him. Uh, for someone listening to this who wants to dig into that area of history, can you share a bit more about your book and where they can get a copy? My book, The Lobotomist, is a biography of Walter Freeman. And he, he was the main developer and promoter of lobotomy. Uh, from the mid-1930s until his death in 1972. And um, so I cover all aspects of his career, uh, including uh, it, since he didn't have Francis Farmer as a famous patient, he did have one other very famous patient, Rosemary Kennedy, who was the sister of President JFK. And uh, he gave her a lobotomy early in her life. That was a terrible disaster, that procedure, a disaster for her. Uh, didn't go well at all. And she was one of the patients left in more of a vegetable kind of state afterwards. If you're interested in uh, hearing more, or reading more about this, the PBS um, American Experience series did a excellent documentary uh, based on my book, which is also called The Lobotomist. And I'd recommend finding that and watching that. And that story led me to another book that I did afterwards called The Nazi and the Psychiatrist, about a psychiatrist who knew Walter Freeman, uh, who, who went on to study uh, the German, the top German prisoners at Nuremberg after World War II who were being held for trial, the people like Goering and, and Hess, um, et, et cetera and about his experience there in Nuremberg and how that greatly affected him. So that's another related book.
the concept of Dr. Freeman is is fascinating to me. Just the idea of you were saying earlier, like two thirds of these aren't going to and either going to be bad or no change. So you're looking at on a good day a third success rate, and to be someone who's who push pushing that as this this can be a cure, but you know that it's <laughs> only a third of them are going to work. I mean, he had to have been a, a fascinating person. To give that context, Freeman began performing lobotomies in 1936. At that time, the success rate of anybody who was committed to a psychiatric hospital um, was probably 1% or 2%. Most people got out of those hospitals by dying. And there, there were no effective treatments. So Freeman, in Freeman's mind, 33% was a lot better than 2% and uh, definitely something worth trying. And he kept it going for decades. Wow. Yeah. Well, I guess when you put it that way, 33% is better than, than two. That's for sure. Well, thank you again so much for your time, Jack. My pleasure, Dan. Thanks for having me here. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Jack Elhai once again for taking the time to help us separate fact from fiction in 1987's Francis. If you want to learn more, I'd really recommend picking up a copy of Jack's book called The Lobotomist, a maverick medical genius and his tragic quest to rid the world of mental illness. That maverick mentioned in the book, of course, is Dr. Walter Freeman, the character we saw giving lobotomies in the movie. You can find links to Jack's book and more of his work in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Francis Farmer was not born into a wealthy family. Number two, Henry York really did help Francis escape from the mental institution. Number three, Dr. Freeman never gave Francis a lobotomy like the movie suggests. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's go backwards and start with number three. Dr. Freeman never gave Francis a lobotomy like the movie suggests. That is true. As we learned from Jack, there were about 300 lobotomies performed at Western State Hospital in the late 1940s and early 1950s, but not to Francis Farmer. That brings us to number two. Henry York really did help Francis escape from the mental institution. That, that's the lie. Jack explained to us that the character of Henry York that we see in the movie was completely fictional. So, of course, that would mean there's no way he could really help Francis escape from anywhere. And that means number one is also true. Francis Farmer was not born into a wealthy family. As you learned earlier in today's episode, Francis's family was not rich. They were lower middle class. That's one reason why Francis was excited to win the trip to Moscow, Russia, because it would drop her back off in New York instead of back in Seattle. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. My hope in sharing this information is to go beyond just my podcast, but hopefully you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. Of course, I only have the stats for my own show. So with that said, today's episode took a total of 35 hours to create. And as I always do, I want to make it clear that is only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 35 hours does not include any of my guest time researching the subject matter we talked about. It also does not include the time it takes for me to do podcast-related things that are not a part of creating this one episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain the Based on a True Story website, social media, the email newsletter, and so on. All those things take time to set up and maintain and cost money that goes beyond things that are associated with this one episode. But they're all things that are required because if I didn't do them, then there wouldn't be any episodes of Based on a True Story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for the sponsors whose ads you've heard on this episode. You can find out more information about them over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash advertisers. But they're not the only ones helping to keep the show alive. There are wonderful people just like you who are helping to keep the show financially going. 
So if you found value in today's episode, and if you're using a podcast 2.0 app, I'd really appreciate it if you boost now. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed today's episode enough to share it with a friend and maybe even consider help to support the next episode over at based on a true story podcast.com slash support. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. And I'll chat with you again really soon.